Welcome to Global Vid, a podcast about original productions and international TV and film distribution. I'm your host, Eric Y. LaPointe, and we're about to learn how people in our industry are expanding their footprint and finding the right partners around the world. This show was created by And Now Global and is also available as an audio format on Apple, Spotify, or your favorite podcast application. Welcome to today's episode of Global Vid. This is officially season two, and we are thrilled to launch starting a MIPCOM week. In today's podcast, we are pleased to introduce you to an experienced creator that has sold and produced over 60 series, 60, and over 3,300 episodes in the United States and around the world. This includes well-known shows such as Chopped, Chop Junior, Chop Champions, Chop Canada, Chop South Africa, America Says. <laughs> Woo, that was a mouthful, huh? Well, Dave Knoll cold develops with his business partner, Cleve Keller, and it could be argued that with 60 plus series together and countless awards, they have become one of the most successful TV development teams in the entire world. And Dave is so generous with his time and advice that we decided to split this up into two parts. And in this first part, we are essentially talking about the 101 of pitching. Let's get started right now and meet Dave. So Dave, how are you this morning? I am outstanding. It is a beautiful day here in glorious New Jersey. New Jersey, (laughs) great. How, How far away though from New York are you? Very close. Well, Maplewood is at a half an hour on the train, and some days it's less. If okay. The, as long as the train works. So in your own words, please share a little bit about your background as a, as a creator. Cleve and I are TV show creators. We create unscripted formats. Our goal every single day, every day of the year, is to create the next survivor or the next Got Talent. Or The Next Shot, which is one of our shows. One of the things I've noticed about you and Cleve is that you have created well over 60 plus shows, which is amazing. And then the last time we spoke, you said you managed to greenlit how many shows in the last 12 months? Yeah, This year, we have nine new deals. I don't know how many of them will go to series. I I pray about it every day, (laughs) Eric. (laughs) (laughs) But this year we have nine new deals, you know, and that's really where my headspace every day is what's the great concept that will sell that will then turn into multiple versions around the world. And so Cleve and I are very, very similar, but in some ways we're different. I call her the Mozart of creating TV formats because she is like a, like a fireworks display, like a popcorn popper of creating formats. I've seen, like we've had meetings on a Friday, a Zoom meeting on a Friday where an executive will say something crazy, like, hey, um, what we're really looking for right now is men 16 to 25. That's our... That, that's our target viewer. And they really like video games, but we don't want to show about video games. We want a competition series that is targeted specifically for them, but an entire family can watch that is in that world of video games, but it's not a video game show. And then my process would be, I would go through our shows and I have files in, on the computer, but literally live right here in the office. And it has all of our old concepts and and, uh, all the work we've done. And I have art books of all the pictures from sets and different logos and all these things. And that's how I create. I I try to get inspired by things around me, but our work from the past. Cleve, so that call actually happened on a Friday. By Monday, she had, I I mean, it must've been, 25 ideas she's amazing like literally amazing like a, as i say like a fireworks display pop 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 like when you're when you're creating with cleave it's not about is there going to be a great idea that's 
it's about she's got all this stuff and it's all way out of the box or 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 a step out of the box or two steps like it's and what you have to do is say whoa 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 that what the heck does that mean i've never heard that before that'll sell and i think that's that's where i live almost every day it's like between the things that i create and the things that cleave creates what will sell and what will then translate to 15, 20 different versions around the world. So that's amazing because the first topic that we're going to talk about is how to pitch. However, what <laughs> I'm hearing from this is that there's a little bit of a deconstruct where you're almost working backwards. You, you're finding out what the broadcasters want first. And then like, like you found out on Friday, what they wanted. And then on Monday, you had these ideas ready to start pitching. There's two different roads that we go on. One is what's the next big giant idea that we could sell around the world? What, what is an idea that's so good? And I, a title, a concept, a hook that's so good and so clean and concise. And the way we look at it really is, you know, if The Rock or Kevin Hart goes into a meeting with their new show and then Cleve Keller and Dave Knoll go into a meeting with their new show. You know, The Rock is really charismatic. <laughs> He's really good. <laughs> Kevin Hart, that guy is funny and has charisma and they're pitching shows. That's who our competition is. And you're going right after Elvis, basically. Exactly. Like, it's He's The Rock. He, he's a little bit better looking than I am, Eric. A little bit. <laughs> So our show has to be so good that they actually are like, well, we could work with The Rock. He's really handsome. And he's had a number of major motion pictures. And his idea was good. And I would like to hang out with The Rock on set. Sure. Or we could go with the Keller Knoll idea. They're clearly better at creating a show, obviously. Do we go with The Rock? Or do we go with Keller? No, our idea has to be that good. There's these two tracks. That's one. And then the other track is, we use the word bespoke, a bespoke show. So as I say, a network will call and they'll say, we're looking for something very specific. Then we go back with two or three of what we think are the best versions of that show. We have one right now where a network came to us and they said they want a game show, and, but with very, very specific parameters. And it's taken us about three weeks, but I think we have two now that are, I'm biased, but I think they're as good as Wheel of Fortune or Jeopardy or Family Feud. How much time do you need to go back to these broadcasters? And would you create these entire pitch decks for each idea? Or would you create these synopsis just to see what they bite on? What would be your approach? We're crazy people. But we <laughs> fall in love with these ideas, right? The two I'm talking about, I am like deeply in love with them. Not, not because I'm naive and, and Cleve says one thing and I'm like, yes, we're done. It's because we put so much work. So America Says is our game show that has become a shockingly big hit in the US. It's now been greenlit for over 400 episodes. 400 episodes in a short amount of time. That's what you're looking for. And by the way, it is a flipping great show. I would put it up against any game show created in the last 10 years. It is that good. There should be Australia says and UK says and Canada says. It doesn't make any sense that that hasn't happened yet, but I digress. But how, how long has that concept been around now? When was the first uh, episode launched? In 2018. Okay, so you still have time. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. The goal then is to create a show that's that good. And America says, or Wheel of Fortune, they're, these are deceptively complex shows. And the reason I say that is because even uh, Got Talent, The Voice, Survivor, Survivor, they seem so simple. What is Survivor? A 
a person who doesn't know television and who doesn't know formats and who doesn't know unscripted could say it's just 16 people on an island playing, you know, running some obstacle courses and doing some puzzles, and then they vote someone off at the end of the episode. True, true, I guess, because the hard part about creating a world-class global hit format is it has to seem effortlessly simple and yet has to be complex enough that someone will watch a thousand episodes, right? Like these diehard America Says viewers, they've watched 400 episodes. The diehard Chopped viewers, they've watched 600, 700 episodes. That's how good those formats are. And potentially of different versions as well. Exactly. Uh, and that's yeah. really the, the heart of everything we do. We created America Says with the thought of, we've been to Scandinavia, we've been to Japan, we've been to the UK, we've been to Spain, we've been to France, and we have met with these executives, we've met with the production companies, we've met with the buyers. The whole goal with America Says from the beginning was this is the perfect show to take off in the US. It is the perfect show to last for hundreds and hundreds of episodes in the US. And then the perfect show to go on to a thousand episodes of Australia Says. It, right. it should have happened already. So, well, we're, we're going to talk about that later on in the show. I, I do hope if, if we still have time, uh, because <laughs> I would love to get into the mechanics of the format, the mechanics of the game show. But let's continue with our first topic and basically the 101 of pitching in a sense. What I'd love to know now at this point is what was your first greenlit show ever? Because there's a part of the show that we always talk about how people got into the industry. With you, I'd like to take a few steps forward and say, okay, you were in the industry already, but how did you get your first show greenlit? And how hard was it? I mean, first of all, it's always hard. There's never, we've had 60 plus shows. We've had two gigantic hits and then a bunch of hits, you know, that lasted multiple seasons in the middle. It's never, there's never one where we're like, well, that was easy. That just doesn't happen. The first show you sell is hard to get on the air. And then, you know, the shows I've sold this year, they're going to be hard to get on the air. It's always hard to get a show on the air. That said, the first one, I think the real answer is my, <laughs> is my brother's late night talk show. <laughs> that, okay. That's a sentence you don't hear every day. Um, I was working at Viacom for seven years, MTV Networks, and was creating shows there. I just started doing it. So you were creating shows in-house at Viacom. So, yeah. so you were already doing it, but, but not for yourself yet. Exactly. And my boss, Bill Brand, at one point, called me into his office and said, hey, this is just advice. I love working with you. You're awesome. Your shows do very well. But if you create from the inside, it's really not going to help you that much. Like maybe you get a bit of a raise or I'll be nicer to you or whatever, but it doesn't help you. If you pitch from the outside, that's the way it's supposed to work. You're not supposed to pitch from the inside. You're supposed to pitch from the outside. And so I went home to my wife and I said, either Bill Brand is trying to get rid of me somehow or I should listen to him. And to her credit, she was like, I, I like Bill Brand. I think he's really smart. I think he's saying the right thing. So the first show I sold after I left MTV Networks was with my brother. I had started a talk show at American University where I went to college. It was called Midnight with Dave Knoll. And it was a talk show and it was great for what it was. And I learned so much writing and hosting and coming up with segments and getting people to run the cameras. <laughs> My brother then, who is four years younger than me and infinitely more talented at being funny and being on camera, took the show over. Um, so by the time he left, between him and I, we had produced well over a hundred episodes. He, at that point, moved right to Los Angeles. And we're talking like, at that point, I had, you know, I started as an intern at MTV Networks and worked my way up. He went out to LA and started as a nothing and got 
a terrible agent and then a, a slightly better agent and got a couple commercials banging around. And um, he, I, I called him and said, I'm, I'm doing this. I'm, I'm going to leave Viacom and I'm going to start creating and selling shows. And obviously I didn't know how hard it was going to be <laughs> or else I probably wouldn't have done it. I was like, your, your show was so good. Let's edit together the best moments of your show and try to sell it. And we came very close to selling it to MTV almost right away. Um, as soon as we had that tape. So that tape was hard to put together, but the tape was his best moments from all these years. So it was very easy to go, oh, that was great. That was great. And the tape was like, because luckily someone very smart who worked in development said to me, you don't want to tape longer than three minutes. So it was like 245 and it was great. It was a, he's amazing. And so we came very, very close to selling it to MTV. I mean, they based, they had said, yes, this is going to sell. And then right in the final moments, they said, we only have the money to do one of these types of shows. We're going to do a different one. And so it was heartbreaking. But that proved to me, oh, it's doable. We came that close at MTV, which is, at, you know, at that point, one of the biggest networks to sell a show to. And so we regrouped and went and sold it to Comedy Central. And they bought a pilot. And we were up against the most amazing group. It was, Martin Short had a pilot at that point. Uh, Bill Murray, that we were thought of in the same sentence as a Bill Murray is insane. Uh, Dave Attell had a show. Like, there was no way that we were going to get to series, essentially. Like, right away, we were like, we heard about who we were up against. And we were like, oh, well, this is never going to happen. But at least let's enjoy ourselves and do this pilot. So what do you think was part of that original pitch that finally got them to say yes to your show? when you were up against this huge talent, celebrity talent. It was, and this is something everyone can learn from. It was that we were instantly different, I think. He was 23 years old and had had 70 episodes of experience. And he was extremely confident and extremely funny. And it's Comedy Central. And so, you know, if, if you're up against... Martin Short and Bill Murray and David Tell and other people, I can't remember who, but big giant names. You have to be doing something obviously unique and that jumps out right away. And we had the weird benefit of, he jumped out right away. He had these, this spiked blonde hair at that point and had this insane energy that Martin Short and Bill Murray and David Tell weren't gonna be able to match because he was 20 or whatever years old and insane. So we did this pilot and it was the whole goal was kind of the anti late night talk show and it got greenlit and it was astonishing. It only lasted 10 episodes. Sadly, we only got one season, um, but it was such a wonderful, crazy, amazing experience. Again, that was the first show I ever sold that I was part of the creative team. It was amazing. It was, it was, I learned everything from that show. So if you, if you could give some advice to new up and coming producers that, or creators that are looking to get their shows greenlit, what is either the number one or the top three things that you have learned that you could share with people? Like it's weird, but it, they seem so basic and yet, but like one thing is a really great title does help. It really, really does. We have sold shows based on titles. Like you need a show that's as good as that title then. But we've sold shows where the, where the buyer saw the title on the piece of paper upside down. And this is one example I'm thinking of in particular. He saw and he got the whole thing from the title. Wow. Okay. And said, I'm going to buy that show. Now the show was also really good. So that helps. And so you need a great title. You need to be positive. You need to be energetic. I, I am dumbfounded when on pitches, people are negative. It is crazy. Like when we're pitching, 
we have the attitude because it's true. We deeply love this show. This is not only going to benefit Cleve Keller and Dave Knoll. This is going to benefit you, buyer. This is going to be the number one hit on your network. And we have figured out why. Like, we've worked really hard. And we're not just saying stuff, right? People come to me and they'll say, I've got this great idea for a cooking competition. The idea is so great. It's going to take over the world. It's going to be. And you're like, no, you don't. You definitely don't. I work with Cleve Keller who I've said it multiple times, is the Mozart of creating shows. Your idea is not as good as the one she could come up with in 30 seconds if I called her out of nowhere and said, cooking competition meets farm, go. She would create a better idea than yours every time. It's what she does for a living. That said, on the other hand, if you cut, like uh, a woman came to me a, a couple months ago, and her name uh, is Chef Lovely. First of all, that's a great title. <laughs> <laughs> Chef Lovely is great, right? Like immediately that caught my attention. Other chefs have come and they'll say, hey, my name is John Smith and I've got a great idea for a cooking show, a cooking competition, whatever it is, a culinary something. And my immediate answer is no, you don't. You do not. I guarantee it. That is not true. You think it is, but you don't know what you're doing. It is like saying, to a basketball coach, hey, I've thought of some great plans, coach of the Knicks. Trust me, you should look at these, at, at these plays. Your plays aren't good, <laughs> right? Now, to be fair, when you're going in to do these pitches, surely you're thinking the same thing. I've got the best idea in front of, in front of me right, right now. Yes, but, but okay, so this is what Lovely did. Her email wasn't, I've got a great idea. Her email was, hey, my name's Chef Lovely. I, I've had an amazing year. So that catches my attention because she's being positive. And she, okay, tell me about it. I've had an amazing year. Uh, my TikTok has blown up and I'm now, my social media footprint is now well over a million followers. Okay, you've got my attention now. You're someone I'm interested in. And then she said, you know, you may not know me. I, I was the first chef that was ever on the Oprah Winfrey network. Now that is to me gigantic. So A, your social media is a million. B, Oprah could have chosen anybody. And the first show she put on the air was Chef Lovely. And then she said, and you know, I got started because Michelle Obama, when she was in the White House, had this initiative and she needed ambassadors and I was chosen as one of her ambassadors. I'm so in at that point, you, I, because I am now addicted to, I have to see Chef Lovely. And by the way, everyone listening should find Chef Lovely on TikTok or, or Instagram, Facebook. She's amazing. And so note what she didn't do. She didn't come to me and say, I've created a great show. That, that is literally a delete. That's like, no, you didn't. You're crazy. It was giving me the bullets that would interest me, right? And so now... Cleve and Lovely and I have created a new show that we're going to go out with in about a month. And for you international buyers out there, it is unlike any culinary show that has ever been created. It has a completely different look and feel that it's all centered around the vibe and the personality of this amazing, young, African-American, just wildly different TikTok star. And it, because of her attitude and her, we have now been able to work together to create a show that it's unlike anything we've ever created before. And yet it's a standalone cooking competition that could be replicated all over the world. And you once worked with uh, Barry Diller and he, <laughs> and you said you had one takeaway from that. And that was don't ever think big. And that seems so, it seems counterintuitive opposite of what we're talking about so could you please deconstruct that for us what does that mean when you're preparing your pitch well first of all we worked with barry diller for four years and it is true when i say of the say 15 most important things i've learned diller said at least 12 or 13 of them like he just rattles things off and then you're like wait a second <laughs> get a notebook i think this might be important and then 
seven years later, you look back and you're like, oh my gosh, he said those words and it changed my life. Okay. And that happened 12 times in four years. When I say don't think big, it was insane to watch because what happened after we were there for about four or five months, we had this gigantic room, this development room, because he's Barry Diller, who's a billionaire, by the way, and he started the Fox network. Like he greenlit the Simpsons and married with children and Tracy Ullman and ran Paramount and was there when they did uh, like Beverly Hills Cop and Raiders of the Lost Ark. He's a genius, right? And now he runs IAC and it's a bunch of tech companies and he's a, like a massive billionaire. So the smartest person ever. And so we had this amazing development room uh, with this enormous wall with a huge whiteboard. And we had all these shows. And one of those shows, just all these shows, we're like, this is great. We're amazing. We're working with Barry Diller. We've got our own development room. We've got offices and then a room. And so one of those shows, we partnered with a talent and sold it to a major network. And they went right to series and bought 10 episodes. And it was like $600,000 an episode. And we had only been there for four or five months. So it was awesome. And we thought that was huge. We didn't think it was big. We thought it was huge. We thought it was amazing. And it was my job to go in once a month and go to the boardroom with all the lawyers and the money people and whatever and present the latest stuff. And so I had this amazing presentation that was full color. It had charts, it had graphs, it had projections, it had everything he wanted. I had prepared backwards and forwards. Right. I looked fabulous. Eric, I looked amazing that day. To the <laughs> point where my wife was like, what are you doing today? And I was like, well, I'm going to go blow Barry Diller's mind. So I go in and, you know, there was color packets for everybody and they passed them out. And then I launched into my presentation, which was five minutes and it was amazing. And I hit every bullet point and he asked questions and other people asked questions and I was on fire because I was thinking big and I thought this is big. Oh my gosh, I'm a big thinker. I'm Dave Knoll, king of the world. I'm gonna present this. I'm sensing a butt, a big butt here. <laughs> First, he said, I'm all done. He said, he's looking through papers, color charts. And he said, why are we doing this again? And I laughed like an idiot. I laughed at Barry Diller, billionaire. Mm. <laughs> and I said, uh, I was totally confused. He said, okay. So I hit a couple of the major points again, real fast in 30 seconds. And he took the pieces of paper, the presentation that I had been working on for weeks and slid it across the desk, this, this, I call it this conference table, which is massive. And it had a gold paper clip and it's true. I can still hear the gold paper clip sliding across the table at me. And he said, it's an effing lemonade stand. And that wow. <laughs> whole thing broke my world, right? Everything I had ever thought smashed. And then he destroyed it. So he spent two minutes basically saying, I get what you're doing. I know this talent. I know the type of show. You're never going to sell another version of this. This won't sell into France or Japan or Spain. This isn't Wheel of Fortune. This isn't Survivor. He, he basically said, I know how this will last two or three seasons on this network. So blah, 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 blah. You're, and then he just gave it. He's like, the maximum amount I'll be generous to you, the maximum amount you're going to make this company is about five or six million total. Over the, no, not, it was less than that. Two or three million total over the course of the next, say, three seasons. He's like, it's not going to last three seasons. But if it does, if you're lucky, 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 it, you'll make two or three million dollars. And to him, literally, it's a lemonade stand. So what I would consider an actual lemonade stand where my daughters go out in our neighborhood and whatever money they make to him. My whole show was that. <laughs> right. And then what was great about it was, you know, he pulls the rug out from under you. He absolutely destroys you. He embarrasses you in front of a room full of people who are all looking at you like, you thought this was big. And it turns out you're a doofus. And, 
And I didn't even realize it at the time, but then he builds you up. And then he says, look, what you and Cleve can do. Let me tell you exactly again, why I hired you. You too have the very unique ability to create the next survivor, to create the next wheel of fortune, the voice, got talent, to create a show that could go around the world in multiple versions. Do that. Don't pitch me again, ever, anything. I don't care if you run out your contract and never tell me another show. Don't pitch me again, unless you see a clear, concise path to $100 million or more globally. So when I say don't think big, I'm saying you're a normal person. 99.99% of us are normal idiots who think we're thinking big and we're not. We're thinking like morons. <laughs> and so what I learned is don't start from your sphere of influence. Start at the very top, Wheel of Fortune. How much money has Wheel of Fortune made and why? Family Feud, Survivor, Got Talent, Big Brother come dine with me. How much money have they made work from there? Now try to create something better than those shows. Better. And that's, that's changed. That was 10 years ago. We, that's every moment of every day has been dedicated to that for 10 so, years. But if you're aiming for that $100 million idea, isn't that still aiming big? No, it's aiming enormous. And that was the danger is I thought big was that show that I had. I thought big was, and he's basically, he destroyed that thought. I thought big was like another, you know, workplace show with a bunch of bearded guys talking about how they don't like their job, but they do something epic or something. I thought that was big. And what he was like, is like, no, 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 no. What's big are the biggest shows in history. And you should try to create something not that good or near there, but better. So let's talk about one of your big shows, which is Chopped and it's Chopped a- Junior and <laughs> Chopped all over the world. How many countries around the world has that uh, now been formatted in? Almost every country now you can see Chopped. It's on almost every territory around the world, either dubbed or in English. Multiple countries now have had their own version of Chopped, including Chopped Canada, which you must know yes. very well, I'm sure. I do, I do. Our families are big fans. And it's amazing. There is an example of a show that is deceptively simple. It is just four chefs and over three competitions in that one hour. First, it's an appetizer. Then at the end of that competition, which lasts about... 10, 12 minutes, then one of the chefs is eliminated. Second competition, a chef is eliminated. Now there's two chefs left. They each cook dinner or or dessert, appetizer, main course dessert. And then one of those chefs is chopped and the other one wins $10,000. And it has now been ripped off multiple times. No one had done a show like that before. Before that, it was only, there's a cooking competition with one competition. And that was it. And now we have reinvented the way culinary shows work. Standalone, self-contained culinary shows. And then other uh, topics have now also not ripped it off. Homage, I I consider it amazing. So it's, I don't, you know, it's not. Did that experience with Barry influence how you ended up pitching Chopped? No, it was vice versa. It was created about a year before. And that's, I think, chicken egg that that's one of the reasons he hired us because he knew that show had enormous potential long before i did all right dave so we've covered a great deal of points on how to pitch i think this has been great and so let's stop here and consider this part one of our show i have more stuff to talk with you about in the next episode in the next part two uh where we'll talk about formatting and also the mechanics of formatting and the mechanics of, of game shows as well. Listeners should definitely join us. Yeah, because part two is going to totally blow your mind. So if you thought part one was good. So thanks a lot for being with me for this first part. For us, it's only a few <laughs> seconds, but for everybody else, you're going to have to wait two weeks. All right, thanks a lot. 
And that concludes today's episode of Global Vid. Thanks to my guest, Dave Knoll of Keller Knoll. Tune in again very soon as we continue with part two of this conversation. Thanks as well to our editor, Nicole Almeida, and our theme song composers, Amber Goodwin and Aaron Ross. See you next time.